Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, Lord, you are the creator of heaven and earth. You have created all things by the word of your mouth. And Lord, we know that you have the power to create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us, which is why we gather today to learn, learn more about Jesus. Lord, I ask that you would speak to every heart here in a way that only you can reach us, that we would understand your voice. And today, if we would hear your voice, that we would harden not our hearts, but be obedient to whatever you are calling us to. Lord, I invite your presence here. In Jesus' name, amen. I wanted to show this video like a few months ago, um, but we'll just show it today because we've got some time. Anyway, we've been talking about faith and righteousness by faith. And what does the law of God want? What does the law of God want? Remember from our studies? Whose obedience does it want? Who gives us that obedience? Whose obedience really is it? Christ. Christ's obedience. Christ's righteousness. So, and that is attributed by what? Faith. Faith. Right. Now I'll read this quote again. The knowledge of what the scripture means by urging upon us the necessity of cultivating faith is more essential than any other knowledge that can be acquired. The knowledge of what the scripture means when urging upon us the necessity of cultivating faith is more essential than any other knowledge that can be acquired. That's from the Review and Herald, October 18, 1898. That's, that's some pretty serious stuff. This video um, is about faith. This is from, I think maybe some of you have seen it. It's from the normal Christian life. It can be a little bit emotional, but I think it's very relevant. Is it possible to live free from fear in a world that is plagued by it? I believe it is. And this became especially important for my wife Haley as the birth of our first child drew near. When I was pregnant with Gabriella, I decided that I didn't want to have any fear during the birth, and that was something that was really important to me. I believe I didn't have any fear during the birth, and it was a very good birth. While Haley was in labour, the nurses kept commenting on how peaceful we were. They weren't used to that. And then I would pray for them, and they definitely weren't used to that, especially one with a neck injury who was healed as I prayed. I'll never forget the first moment I saw Gabriella. She was a perfect little baby. I can remember looking at her and saying, Haley, she's got your lips. The first half an hour was the most incredible half an hour of my life. You did it, babe. What's her name? Her name is Gabriella. Yeah. Little did we know, in an instant, everything would change and our decision to have no fear was about to be put to the test. About half an hour after she was born, they noticed that she was breathing really quickly. It kept getting worse and worse. She required more and more oxygen. She started to have some breathing problems and um, needed some oxygen. So at that time we got the paediatrician to come in and help us as well. And from there, she just rapidly deteriorated very quickly. The paediatricians and the people I'd call in to assist took Gabriella with Nathaniel to the special care nursery. I joined Gabriella in the nursery and it became clear that this was really serious. They had her on oxygen and they were trying to get needles into her tiny veins in order to sedate her. And they kept missing the vein over and over again. All the while, I had my hands on her and I was praying for her, telling her, Daddy's here, Daddy's here. If we're not careful, 
will be thanking God when things are going well and moments later blaming Him when they're not. But it's the enemy who comes to kill, steal and destroy. Jesus brings life. Finally, they, uh, they got Gabriella to sleep and um, Haley came in and the doctor took us into the next room. At this point, she was unconscious because they had heavily sedated her. They had to put a tube down her throat and give her 100% oxygen. Nathaniel and I were in a little room next to the room where Gabriella was. Five minutes after they put the tube down her throat, her heart stopped. None of the doctors expected that. Nobody expected that. We heard the sound of doctors and buzzers going off. They were doing CPR on our daughter. And we heard the sound of one, one two, two, three, breathe. One, two, three, breathe. What do we do as Christians in moments like this when we're facing serious trials? Sometimes we can be overwhelmed and even pray out of fear. What if we were not moved by situations around us because of who he is within us? So that's exactly what I did. I looked at Haley and I held her hand. Nathaniel just said to me, let's have no fear. Let's just pray and let's just believe God. I was just like, okay. <laughs> and I put my hand on his hand and the nurse next to us put her hand on our hands and she said, let's pray. It was at that moment that we realized Amy, the midwife, was actually a Christian. So we just started praying. And I just thought, this is, I'm here today because I need to stand in the gap. Nathaniel said, I just rebuke the spirit of death. And I was like, whoa, harsh, you know, like. <laughs> but it really challenged me. It's like, no, there's, there's actually a fight right now going on for her life. Minute after minute went by without a pulse, and we continued to pray, not begging God, but partnering with Him, knowing it was His will to heal her. For me, that was a very weak moment. <laughs> but uh, right then, I saw a vision of Jesus. I saw Him walk up to Gabriella. I saw him put his hand on her. Next time you see this plant in your backyard, don't cut it down, because this is the best natural painkiller you'll ever find. After four minutes, Gabriella's heartbeat came back. opportune time for this happening. <laughs> From that moment when I saw that vision of Jesus, for me, it was okay. Her heart had started again after four minutes, but she was grey. It's the colour of death. The logical conclusion was that Gabriella wouldn't survive. Doctors came in to us and they said, things are very serious. We don't know what's wrong, but something is very wrong. They were very concerned and trying to prepare us for the worse. But I've made a choice in my life to share the gospel no matter what. And the nurse that was telling us the bad news seemed to have an issue with her throat. So even in that moment, I told her, we're not worried, God has our daughter, but let me pray for your voice. So I prayed for her. The doctors were used to people being destroyed in situations like this, but Haley and myself had a God-given peace. So they assumed we were in denial about the gravity of the situation and contacted our pastor, hoping she'd speak some sense into us. But they didn't know our pastor. I got a phone call from the hospital saying, Pastor Catherine, uh, uh, something has happened. And I could tell from the tone of her voice she was very worried. So I said, what's, what's gone on? And she said, well, baby's had a heart attack. 
and that was enough for me that these guys are family. As I walked in, the nurses were waiting for me and they said, we're so glad you're here. You need to help them understand that really this is much more serious than they seem to, to realise. I think they thought that I was going to help with the grief counselling. I looked at them and thought, mm, you've got the wrong lady here. As I walked in, Nathaniel's praying for one of the nurses, as you would expect, because that's just who he is. And Haley had just a supernatural peace. And I said to them, well, Haley, you need to start expressing. Nurses, you need to make sure she starts expressing milk. This baby is going to feed. This, this, is, this is going to be normal. And I'm pretty sure the nurses were all thinking, I don't think they understand. <laughs> so we just prayed, we worshipped. Well, there was Gabriella all hooked up to the life support machine. And I said, let's take a picture. I remember overhearing one of your pastors say, take a photo of her like this because you're going to need it for the testimony. And I was like, oh Lord, please let that be true because all of the facts tell us it's impossible. We were then transferred to one of the biggest hospitals in the area and Gabriella was placed in a nursery for babies in critical condition. Gabriella's state was rapidly deteriorating and they were struggling to keep her alive. One lung collapsed, then the other. They'd given her shots of adrenaline. She had tubes everywhere. But it was almost like I was in a bubble of God's peace. I just knew that God was holding us, holding her. Early the next morning, I was sitting next to Gabriella, reading the Bible to her. One of the doctors came in and he said to me, Nathaniel, can you take a seat? I could tell this was a difficult conversation for the doctor to have to have with me. He was trying to console me about the situation with my daughter. And at a certain point, I stopped him and said, Doctor, I need you to understand. I'm not worried because I'm a man of God. Just tell me the facts so I know what to pray for. Then he opened up and explained, that because of the lack of oxygen to my daughter's brain during the four minutes that her heart had stopped, he believed that she had brain damage and that that was the reason she was not responding. I asked the doctor, what would you need to see to know that she's doing okay? And he said, well, she's not responding. So any response. So I asked him, what would you think if she opened her eyes? And he said, I'd be astonished. I looked him in the eyes and I said, Doctor, prepare to be astonished. God's going to heal my daughter. What do you need prayer for? He was so impacted that he just said, Wow, you're very kind. Thank you. And I got to pray for it. You may think that what I'm wearing right now is soft body armor. And I don't blame you because it looks like soft armor. At this point, we and many others had been praying for almost two days. And medically speaking, there was no reason to think we would ever see our daughter's eyes again, let alone any form of recovery. I went into a bathroom and I shut the door. Gabriella wouldn't survive. Something is very wrong with your baby. With your baby. Serious breakdown. I've learned that not every thought that enters my head is my own. And as I was in that bathroom, this boldness came over me. I had complete confidence that God would heal my daughter. But I also knew that even losing my daughter could not steal the peace I have in Jesus. And I said, enemy, your plans to take my daughter will not succeed. But no matter what happens to my daughter, my peace is in Christ alone. That night, Haley and I were sitting and looking at Gabriella. After two days of not seeing my baby's eyes, she opened her eyes and she looked at us 
And that was just amazing. The doctors were surprised. <laughs> Not only had she opened her eyes, but it was suddenly as if she was perfectly healthy. Even her lungs, which had previously collapsed and should have shown abnormalities, now looked completely normal. And the same doctor I said prepare to be astonished to came running in with an x-ray of her lungs. And he was like, this is amazing, this is amazing. And I said, this is Jesus. The doctors kept doing their tests and they couldn't find anything wrong. No brain damage, no lung trauma, nothing wrong with her heart. No one could explain it, but she was instantly well. She didn't even need a feeding tube. She went straight to breastfeeding. She was healthy and normal. Developmentally, you look at her now, she is perfect, absolutely perfect. <laughs> I love it, there is nothing God can't do. My mind couldn't reconcile this grey child with tubes everywhere to a robust newborn going home. She was healed miraculously. It certainly was obvious that these guys were a Christian family. They'd called upon God and their God had answered their prayers. Over the next few days, most of the doctors and nurses who had helped with Gabriella came to see her amazed at the change. All the world's waiting to see what it looks like for Christians to go through trials and have unconditional peace. In every situation, God wants us to have no fear because He is perfect love. Mommy! Mommy! I'm coming! Uh, tear jerker, huh? <laughs> I've seen that three or four times and I get choked up because my Sarah was kind of born in a kind of the same way. She came out, she had very low APGAR, wasn't breeding, almost no heartbeat, and you know, not as bad as that. But um, anyway, there is a time of trouble coming, and it's not very far away, is it? The signs of the times declare that the coming of Christ is at hand and even at the doors. And we know that just before Christ is to come back, there is to be a tremendous time of trouble. Now, these experiences that we see other people go through, you see the peace that they go in through these situations with. This is, this is a type of the peace that we need that only Christ can give. What do you guys think of that? It's pretty powerful. Amen. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. Now, these people weren't Adventists. They're evangelicals. I mean, you can tell they're wearing jewelry, they have a woman pastor and this and that. But God is still working with them, right? <laughs> they believe, right, they believe. Well, they're, yeah, most of the world is, I agree. I absolutely agree. So I thought that, I thought that was pretty impactful. It fit in better a few weeks ago with one of the sermons I did, but I thought that it was appropriate to show it to today because the faith that we're going to need, not just in the time of trouble, but right now, is that type of faith. Where no matter the situation that we find ourselves in, if we start losing children, if we start losing spouses, if we start losing houses and lands, we need to be able to say with Paul, none of these things move me. Because my feet are planted firmly on the rock, Jesus Christ. So let's turn to Revelation, chapter 3. I know Rick Koontz has been really harping on this, but we're going to look at one aspect. <clears throat> Revelation, chapter 3, I guess I'll start in verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, 
These things shall the amen these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. It's interesting. It says, you don't know. You don't know that you are wretched. You don't know that you're miserable. You don't know you're poor. You don't know you're blind. And you do not know you're naked. And who's saying this? Jesus. And who's he saying it to? Us. So can we say that we know that we're blind and we know that we're poor and we know that we're wretched? Jesus says, you don't know it. So what do we have to say? I don't know it. He's right, right? This is coming from him. I don't know it. I don't know it. You're right, Lord. I don't, I don't know that I'm naked, naked. I don't know I'm wretched. I don't know I'm blind. I don't know I'm miserable. I don't know I'm poor. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed with that thy shame so that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see as many as I love I rebuke and chasten be zealous therefore and repent behold I stand at the door and knock if any man hear my voice and open the door I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I have overcome and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let's look at verse 18 again. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that the shame of thy nakedness Do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. So we're going to look a little bit at the white raiment. There's a picture of it on the screen. <laughs> Just a blank slide. What is the white raiment? Righteousness. Thank you. It is righteousness. Now, whose righteousness is it? Christ's righteousness. Yes, it's absolutely Christ's righteousness. And since it's Christ's righteousness, whose righteousness is that? Whose righteousness is Christ's righteousness? God's righteousness, right? So it's God's righteousness, the righteousness of God. So what is righteousness? What's the two little word that we've been using, two words together? Right doing. Absolutely. Righteousness is right doing. Plain and simple. That's what it is. Sometimes we get tricked into thinking it's this aura, like I have this aura of righteousness around me, you know. But in, in actual fact, righteousness means right doing. It's very simple. Right doing. Psalms 119, 172. My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are what? Righteousness. So there's a doing aspect to the commandments, is there not? <laughs> there has to be. Many of us think the absence of a negative is the presence of a positive. Now, if we're living in the world and we quit drinking, we quit smoking, we quit sleeping around, we quit doing all these things that we used to do in the world, does that somehow make us better? We've just gotten rid of negatives, but the absence of a negative does not mean that there's a presence of a positive. So you need righteousness and not your own. You need Christ's righteousness, which is the Father's righteousness, the Father's right doing in your life. And all of God's commandments are righteousness, are right doing. Matthew 22, 37 to 40. And Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these hang the law and the prophets. I remember Mark did a, Mark Clemenson did a, a sermon on this back at the barn. He talked about the, the two great commandments, and this, 
This is what Jesus says. This is the first and the second commandment. It's interesting because the first thing that Jesus, the first four commandments deal with our relationship to who? God. And the second six? Right. So you have a cross there if you go like this with it. <clears throat> so, whose righteousness are we to seek? Christ. Whose are we to have? Right. Okay, so now let's use the word right doing. Whose right doing are we to have? <laughs> God's Christ. Nothing changes, right? Yes, Christ's righteousness. But whose right doing was in Christ? We already mentioned it, but let's go over the point again. Whose right doing was in Christ? God. And we find that all over the Gospels, but in John 5.30, Jesus says, I can of my own self do nothing. Now, remember a few weeks ago I read um, in Matthew 22, oh, excuse me, I think it's Matthew 25, 26, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, and the scribes and the Pharisees, they come by and they wag their heads at him, and thou that, you know, sayest you will destroy the temple and build it up in three days, if you be the Son of God, Cast thy, take thyself off the cross and we will believe you. Save yourself. But could Jesus save himself? Really think about that. Right. I mean, it's kind of hard to wrap your brain around because, wait a minute, Jesus, the commander of heaven's armies, he, he did give up his omnipotence, his omniscience, and his... What's the other one? There's three. Omnipresence, omnipotence, omnipotence. All-knowing, all-powerful, and, and all place at the same time. He gave up all that. He gave up all this power to be fully relying on God, not himself. That's why he says, I could have my own self do nothing. So he could not have taken himself down off the cross unless it was the Father's will. Yes? He wouldn't be our example. Amen. Good point. He's our every right. Right. Mm. Right. Oh no, I, I no, I, I think you're right. If, if the plan of salvation is to be carried out, then he could do nothing. He couldn't do it, right? I mean, yeah, he, pro he could have gone rogue and pr probably done his own thing, but right here he says, I can of my own self do nothing, so it would have to be given him of the Father. Right. And so what is this righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, to us right now? How do we make it applicable? How, how do we see it in the lights of events that are happening on the earth in our day-to-day -day life? Joel 2.23. This is a very interesting study I was sharing with Rick earlier. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the latter the rain. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. I know this verse, you guys have probably looked a lot at this verse, studying the latter rain. Let's, let's talk about it. What, what do you guys see when you see this verse here? What, what is somebody, what is the latter rain? What is the former rain? Holy Spirit, right? Yes, the Holy Spirit is, is part of the answer. Absolutely. If you, if you have a margin, or if you read a Strong's, or if you look at the original Hebrew, this word, for he hath given you the former rain moderately. If you look that phrase up in any Bible, it's going to give you this word, these words. Teacher of righteousness. Now, when you read this text, you don't really see that, do you? 
but unless you look, you do a little digging, you can kind of see what's going on here. So, for he has given you the teacher of righteousness. He has given you the teacher of righteousness. And he will cause to come down for you the rain. And that rain, actually, when it's by itself right there, actually means downpouring or violent, violent downpouring of rain. So it's a lot of rain that's coming down. The former rain and the latter rain in the first month. So God is going to give us a teacher of righteousness according to righteousness. Pretty interesting, huh? He has given us a teacher of righteousness. So what is the latter rain? <laughs> a teacher of righteousness. The latter rain is a teacher of righteousness. What is another, what are some other names that we call the latter rain? What are some other phrases that we say? The outpouring, right? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We're always looking into the future of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, aren't we? Are we just taught in, in, in basically most people will teach you that when the outpouring happens or just before the Lord comes, he's going to give us the outpouring. That way we can get ready, right? You always have this stuff like it's in the future. It's in the future. You can't, you can't plan for it now. But the Bible says that he has given us the teacher of righteousness already. And he's going to cause the teacher of righteousness to come back again. And it's going to be a violent downpouring of righteousness. <laughs> it's a pretty awesome illustration if you think about it. Right. Yeah, rain. So, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or the, the times of refreshing. So, the latter rain... What is the latter rain to the third angel's message? It's a loud something. A loud cry. The latter rain to the third angel's message is a loud cry. Is the is the loud cry? So what is the message? Righteousness. Righteousness. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> right. Pretty much with the studies we're doing: Jesus, God, <laughs> three, seven, twelve, or righteousness. Or faith is the answer. <laughs> Good job. Um, so it is the beginning light of the third angel's message. I got to read you guys this quote here: "A teacher of righteousness." Now this is from Last Day Events in Romans nine twenty eight. The time of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. This is the beginning of the light of the third angel whose glory is to fill the whole earth. And whose glory is supposed to fill the whole earth? What chapter in the Bible were we talking about earlier? Rick? Remember you brought it up? Revelation 18, right? Right, right. 18, 1 through 4. Right. I'll just read the whole thing. I'll just go to Revelation 18, 1 through 4 right now and read it. Since we're talking about it. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and her merchants, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich with the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. So, what's about to happen after this message is given? Plagues. The plagues are coming. And to me, the beginning of the message is for us to do now. Until then, you know, that's, that's the final touch, the final you know, outpouring. You know, he's himself. Right. You need to give the first and second angel's message when you give the third angel's message. Yet, the Bible says here, in the middle, yet the work will be cut short in righteousness. What work will be cut short in righteousness? 
the third angel's message will be cut short in righteousness. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the world to the other, to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God, which closes the work of the third angel. So in Revelation 18, the glory of God. The angel comes down, lightens the whole earth with the glory of God. This is the glory of God, which closes the work of the third angel. Now these are some pretty heavy quotes. <clears throat> The message of Christ's righteousness closes the work. And then at the top it says, The time is of test is just upon us, for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. So it has already begun. Do you guys know where and when this message started? Oh, close. A little later. In Minneapolis. 1888. Remember, if you guys are familiar with the 1888 message, Jones and Wagner, they presented these, the righteousness by faith, that it was God's obedience and God's faith. And all the brethren who had been Christians their whole lives, when they heard the message of Christ's righteousness, they loved it, but they didn't like it because, in one aspect because it was crucifying to self because you're telling me I've been working my whole life on this and now I have to rely on God for everything? I want to work my way. And most of the brethren in that meeting rejected it. And it's still rejected. So let's think about this. If they rejected the righteousness of Christ, what did they reject? Christ. But they also rejected what message? The third angel's message. They rejected the loud cry. Makes sense, right? Right now, we are under the loud cry of the third angel, are we not? <laughs> the message of the Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the world to the other, to prepare the way of the Lord. This is the glory of God, which closes the work of the third angel. Isn't the verse 8, the three angels' message, is it the word in there, made? Let me read it. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen. 14, 8? Yeah. The second angel's message? And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Made. She that's, that's like Sunday law. Because that's when you're going to, the church is going to make people go to church and honor what, what they're teaching. Well, yeah, that's definitely going to happen. That's, that's definitely, they're going to try to force. They're going to try to... Absolutely. It's a very good point. You know, Ellen White, I know your wife's going to get mad at me because I don't have the quote right here. <laughs> but... She says, Ellen White says, that those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and customs will find it an easy matter to take the mark when it is urged upon them. An easy matter. And it's all deception, absolutely. Now we have, just like you mentioned, brother, the whole infrastructure around this vaccine, the COVID, the climate crisis, all this economy stuff, it's all just in one big soup, and they're going to get what they want out of it. But we know it's not going to last very long. And the reason that I, I have this philosophy that, well, first we know that the wheat and the tares grow together. So the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light seem to be manifesting at the same time. And it's easy to see the kingdom of darkness, what they're doing right now, but that tells me that God's kingdom is actually working as well. It's working in the hearts of his people. He's reaching people. Because you got people who are going, distributing literature to people in Monument Square. You got other people who are doing Bible studies. So, when this message is received and carried out, what does it mean? When the message of the third angel is fully received and carried out and not, uh, not you know, damp, dampened down and preach the fullest extent of what it means, the righteousness of Christ. What does that tell us where we are in the span of time? It's our final choice. The it, world's choice. It's the, the final choice. choice to make, and that's the, 
Right. It's the final message of mercy. It means that we are very close to having this whole thing wrapped up. And this is why, you know, Pastor Rick has been coming here and preaching out the Laodicean message. The Laodicean message is to prepare people to receive and give the third angel's message, the loud cry of Christ's righteousness, which says, this is the glory of God, which closes the work of the angel, uh, with the third angel, excuse me. The message of Christ's righteousness is to sound from one end of the world to the other to prepare the way of the Lord. So this work actually prepares the way of the Lord. You know that you can actually hasten the coming of Christ by your submission and willing to be made willing. He'll use you to give the loud cry of the third angel. And you might not even speak a word, but the way you're living can be sometimes a louder sermon than anything that's preached from up here. Now, it is the time for this work to be closed up. Shortly, because now we are under the cry of the third angel. The latter rain, the loud cry of the third angel's message. But remember what the latter rain is when we looked at in, uh, in Joel over here? Excuse me. I go back too far. Remember what it says right here what righteousness is? What is it? A teacher of? Teacher of righteousness. The, excuse me. The former rain moderately in the latter rain. He's going to give us a teacher of righteousness. What is the latter rain teaching us? <laughs> right doing. It's teaching us the right doing of Christ. That's Joel. Yes. And in the, in the, not the testimonies, but in the fundamentals, she calls her a pilot and says something about many will not follow the pilot and that will leave them out of, out of the picture, so to speak. I don't know how exactly said that. But. Right. It's, it's too crucifying to follow this. Not only to the flesh, well, absolutely to the flesh, but to the pride, to the selfishness. We had a meeting on Tuesday night, and I'm telling you, for the next, until now, my pride was pricked hard. And I was deeply reflecting, because it was, I could tell that it was the truth, and I was wrestling, and I was fighting against it. But I knew it was the truth. And so it's crucifying to accept this message of righteousness by faith. That it's not you who does it, it's Christ who does it in you, but you have to be willing to be made willing, and then Christ can work with that. So I want to read a couple of quotes right here, some really powerful stuff from The Great Controversy, page 611. <clears throat> the angel who unites in the proclamation of the third angel's message is to lighten the whole earth with his glory. The work, a work of worldwide extent is unwa of an unwanted power is here foretold. The Advent movement of 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every missionary station in the world, and in some countries there was a great religious interest which had been, which has been witness in any land since the reformation of the 16th century but these are to be exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel which is what the loud cry which is what the teacher of righteousness righteousness by faith Christ's righteousness the work will be similar to that of the day of Pentecost as the former reign was given in the out in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the opening of the gospel, the cause of, uh, to cause the opening, excuse me, I'm going to start that again. The work will be similar to the day of Pentecost, as the former rain was given in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at the opening of the gospel to cause the upspringing of the precious seed, so the latter rain will be given at its close for the ripening of the harvest. So the latter rain is to be given for the ripening of the harvest. Now what is that latter rain? 
It's a teacher of righteousness, right? Am I conf is anybody confused? Let's stop and talk about this. Ed. Are you saying that's Jesus, the Holy Spirit? Or? Well, it's Holy Spirit, absolutely. But it's, it's a message of whose righteousness? His righteousness, right? Christ's righteousness. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. Hosea 6.3 Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain. Joel 2.23 in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and it shall come to pass whatsoever that what that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Acts two seventeen <clears throat> and twenty one. The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The prophecies which were fulfilled in the outpouring of the former rain at the opening of the gospel are again to be fulfilled in the latter rain as its close. At its close. Here are the times of refreshing to which the Apostle Peter looked forward to when he said, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus. Acts 3, 19 and 20. Servants of God, with their faces lightened up and shining with holy consecration, will hasten from place to place to proclaim this message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought. The sick will be healed. The signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. Thus the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. The message will be carried not, by, not so much by argument as by the deep conviction of the Spirit of God. The arguments have been presented, the seed has been sown, and now it will spring up and bear fruit. The publications distributed by missionary workers have exerted their influence. Yet many whose minds were impressed have been prevented from fully comprehending the truth or from yielding obedience. Now the rays of light penetrate everywhere. The truth is seen in its clearness. The honest children of God sever the bands which have held them. Family connections, church relations are powerless to say them now. Church relations are powerless to say them. Why would the church be holding this message back? <laughs> Doesn't make sense, does it? Truth is more precious than all besides. Notwithstanding the agencies combined against the truth, a large number take their stand upon the Lord's side. That's from the chapter, the final warning in Great Controversy. In the very next chapter is the time of trouble. So just before the time of trouble, this message of Christ's righteousness has to go from one end of the earth to the other. And everybody here, all of us in this room, me included, are those missionaries who can help give this message to the whole world. Are we not? Do you want to hasten the coming of Christ? I do. I, I mean, not that I can do it of myself, but I can submit and ask for guidance on how this is to happen. I mean, this is a deep privilege to be, to be privileged where we live right now at this time. I mean, you do not need to be a prophet or have a prophet's eye to see that we have a few short years left, maybe at best. I mean, am I, am I off in the willy wax here? Or does anybody else feel that way? <laughs> Amen. Praise God, you can see it. Now, early writing 71 essentially says the same thing, but it's I'm going to read it too. <clears throat> I saw that many do not realize what they must be in order to live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest in the sanctuary through the time of trouble. Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected in the time of trouble must reflect the image of Jesus fully. So, in order to make it through the time of trouble and to meet Jesus in peace, whose image must you have? Christ's image. 
Jesus' image. You must reflect those who will receive the seal of the living God. Does anybody here want the seal of the living God? And are protected in the time of trouble, must reflect the image of Christ, of Jesus, fully. Now, we watched that video earlier. Do you think those guys, did they look to you like they were reflecting the image of Christ? They claim the promise. They're praying with everybody. Just, you know, we're fruit inspectors. On the outside, it looks good. God knows the heart. But that kind of peace that they had going through that storm, that's the peace that will be given us. I saw that many were neglecting the preparation so needful and were looking to the time of refreshing and the latter rain to fit them to stand in the day of the Lord and in his sight. So you think there's a lot of us who are just waiting for the latter rain to fit us for, fit us for the work? How many people just put it off like we were talking about in the future? It's in the future. When it comes, it's going to hit me, and then my character is just magically going to be changed, and I'm going to get on the street corners with a microphone and start preaching that Jesus is coming soon. Yeah, it's kind of like the, um, the rapture for the evangelicals because they, they feel like they don't have to do anything because they're going to be taken out. It's just going to be God somehow has more respect for them than anybody else in the history of the world, and is just going to miraculously pull them out. Right. And, so. and it's, such a, it's such a sad deception that we see these people in because if that is the philosophy that they've adopted, well, what, is, what is the logical outcome of adopting that philosophy? Failure. Failure. Death. Yeah, Walter Blank says that if you're not doing the work now, you will not receive the latter rain. He says it pretty clearly. Well, it's consistent with the quotes we've been reading. Yeah. Oh, how many I saw in this time of trouble without a shelter. They had neglected the needful preparation. Therefore, they could not receive the refreshing that all must have to fit them to live in the sight of a holy God. Just like you just said. Neglecting the preparation. Those who refused to be hewed by the prophets and failed to purify their souls in obeying the whole truth and who are willing to believe that their condition is far better than it really is. You know, just like we read in the Laodicean message. You know, you don't know that you're poor. You don't know you're blind. You don't know you're naked. You don't know you're wretched. But some of us say, well, I know I'm a Laodicean. I know I'm all these things. <laughs> but the Bible also says, if we say that we know anything, we don't know that as we ought to know. Right? So when Christ in, in his mercy, because those who I love, I rebuke and chasten. Tell us, tell Josh, tell Paul, tell, tell Alex and Rick, and tell all of us, tell you personally, that you are all these things and you don't know it. We have to say, amen, I don't know it. I don't know it. Please teach me. And you know what? If you tell a little kid something that they don't know, what do they say? <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> Jackson might say something different, but, you know, most of the time that they want to know if they don't know, right? But we, we, we're, you know, we know, we know. I've been an Adventist for 30 years. I know, I know my condition, right? <laughs> that condition and that philosophy, that my mentality is going to lead me straight to hell and anybody who goes along with it. And then if I die before the second coming of Christ, when I am resurrected, and I think it's Christ coming to resurrect me because I died believing in my own self-righteousness, I'm going to wake up and I'm going to see everybody else coming out of their graves who at the end of a thousand years, I'm going to see all these wicked people coming out of their graves. And I'm going to be numbered with that group. But I'm not like these guys. They're murderers. They're rapists. They're, they're killers. Look at this guy. Hitler's over here. Napoleon. All these terrible, wicked guys. Why am I with them? Simple. I did not fully rely on Christ. I thought I could save myself. I knew that I was wretched. I knew that I was naked. <laughs> but Christ says, no, 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 you don't know. Let me tell you. This is some solemn stuff. Those who refuse to be hewed by the prophets and fail to purify their souls in obeying the whole truth and who are willing to believe that their condition is far better than it really is will come up to the time of the falling of the plagues and then see that they needed to be hewed and squared for the building. But there will be no time to do it in. 
there will be no mediator to plead their cause before the Father. Before this time, the awful, solemn declaration has gone forth. What is that declaration? Revelation 22. You guys know it. He that is... Yes, that's it. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. I saw that none could share in the refreshing unless they obtained the victory over every besetment. Every besetment. This is where we really need to pay attention. Over pride, selfishness, love of the world, and over every wrong word and action. Think about, think about that. Think about every wrong word you've ever spoken or texted. Or maybe there's a Facebook meme or something like that and you liked it. You're consenting to that if it has a wrong word. And right now, this is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit speaking to us that says, I saw that none, that means nobody, anybody, no, anybody who has not purified their souls and gotten the victory over every besetment, over pride, selfishness, love of the world, and every wrong word and action would obtain the victory. They would not share in the refreshing. And what is the refreshing? We looked at the beginning. The Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the latter rain, the teacher of righteousness, which prepares the way for the coming of the Lord. We should therefore be drawing nearer and nearer to the Lord and be earnestly seeking that preparation necessary to enable us to stand in the battle of the day of the Lord. Let all remember that God is holy and that none but holy beings can ever dwell in his presence. <laughs> I sometimes say that to some people to really try to get their attention. Some people who I know are in the world and I love them. And, I'm taught, and they talk to me about going to heaven. And not, I'm not judging, but you can tell, you know, the fruits. You can kind of see where the fruits are. And I have friends who, who, who drink and smoke, and they think they're going to heaven, and they still party around and everything. And then I tell them, like, well, you know, God is holy, and the angels are holy. You're going to be in heaven with angels who have never thought a sexually perverse thought, who have never said even a vegetarian swear word. You know? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about, Jackson. <laughs> so what must our condition be if we are to live in the presence of a holy God? We must be like him, right? We must reflect the image of Jesus fully. But all remember that God is holy, and none but holy angels, none but holy beings can ever dwell in his presence. So would the practical application be repentance? Is that the only thing we have control over? Or do we even have control over that? Well, it is God, uh, in, um, in Philippians it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works to will and to do of his good pleasure in you. So even that repentance is his, and he's giving it to you. Oh, my computer. Amen. Without that repentance, we'll never make it. And you know why? It's, it goes back to what we were preaching, or what I was preaching about a few, a month ago or so. Unless we see our condition... Unless we can look in the mirror and realize that we can't do it, we have to have Christ. But even the recognition that we can't do it ourselves is from him. Because the Bible says to every man is given a measure of faith, right? So we all start out with a measure of faith. But, it, but what is faith? Remember we looked at this. Believing the word of God and expecting it to depend, and depending on it and expecting it to do what the word says. So every man is given a measure of that. You know, we saw this when we looked at the Roman centurion, you know, who had the servant who was sick. 
and he said, Lord, just speak the word. All you got to do is speak the word because he believed that word. He had, he had faith in that word. I need, I need help, and I know where the source is. God, help me to be willing to be made willing. And Amen. Paul said, I have not yet attained. So you have to have the right attitude. That's what God is looking for, and let him do the work. And when the refreshing comes, let him do the work. Amen. Thank you, sister. Yes. I think whatever, that's what sanctification is after justification is the process of refining us we're not going to you know so maybe the people who see Christ coming up you know are alive to see him remain are actually reflecting his character back to them but the vast majority of us are going to go to our graves still yes okay. yeah I, I believe I believe that I we won't, and we won't be free of this evil desire until we're home you know until we leave the world behind and we'll always have to be warring against it because even christ was warring against it when he was here <coughs> <clears throat> this is from the review and herald november 22nd 1892 that which satan has led men to do in the past he will if possible lead them to do again the early church was deceived by the enemy of god and man and apostasy was brought into the ranks of those who profess to love God. And today, unless the people of God awake out of sleep, they will be taken unawares by the devices of Satan. And that's an interesting quote right there. What are all the devices that most people are in the church are, are talking about now? We have social justice. We have climate justice. We have everything other than... We have critical race theory. We have all, all these things other than what we should be focusing on. And then she, she says right here, the early church was deceived by the enemy of God and man, and apostasy was brought into the ranks of those who profess to love God. And today, unless the people of God awake out of sleep, they will be taken unawares by the devices of Satan. Among those who claim to believe in the near coming of the Savior, how many are backslidden? How many have lost their first love and come under the deception written, in the written of in the Laodicean church, dom denominating them as neither cold nor hot? Satan will do his utmost to keep them in a state of indifference and stupor. <laughs> have you tried talking or reaching out in love to one of your brothers and sisters who has gone down one of these rabbit holes and it's like trying to talk to a wall sometimes? Have you noticed that? It's constantly, and sometimes it's being preached in the pulpit. Yeah, I mean, it's easy because we, we, I don't know what it is, humanity thinks it's going to, it's going to pick itself up out of its own, it's going to create its own Eden. And, and I see where Christians think it's part of Christ's message to be social justice warriors and stuff like that. But the main point, if, if you preach the gospel, of Jesus Christ and his character, that should all take care of itself. Amen, amen. I love this quote. I, I've, it's from Sons and Daughters. It says, one interest will prevail. One subject will swallow up every other. Christ's, Christ our righteousness. Such a powerful quote. May the Lord reveal to his people the perils that are before them that they may arouse from their spiritual slumber and trim their lamps and be found watching for the bridegroom when he shall return from the wedding. The days in which we live are eventful and full of peril. The signs of the coming of the end are thickening around us. Wow, this is true. This is 130 years ago almost. And events are to come to pass that will be more terrible, of a more terrible character than any the world has yet witnessed. More terror. I mean, this World War II and World War One and all the wars we've had since 18, basically since 1900, this was written before that. So I got to believe that whatever's coming is going to be worse than that. And that was pretty bad. You watch some of these documentaries on World War II and uh, what, 300 million people were killed or something like that, some ridiculous number. And what, what is coming on the earth is going to be much, much worse than that. 
And that's when the guillotine was created by some doctor named Guillotine. And they just took the heads off of women, children, anybody that they wanted to. Right. Anybody who doesn't go along. Right. Which is coming. Which is coming. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. But to those who have the light of truth, it has been written, Ye brethren are not in darkness, that day, that, that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. And that, knowing the time, that it is now high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore, excuse me. No, that's right. The night is far spent. The day, it is, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. Watch ye therefore. For ye know not when the master of the house cometh. At even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing. Or in the morning, lest he coming suddenly find you sleeping. There is great need that our awakening faith should be quickened. What's that mean to quicken? Made alive. Made alive, right? Got the blood flowing through it, you know? Really. There is great need that our weakening faith should be quickened. And that we should keep ever in mind, before, before our mind, the evidences that our Lord is soon coming that we may ever be found not only waiting, but watching and working. We are not to be found in idle, expect idle expectancy, for this leads to carelessness of life and de deficiency of character. We are to realize that the judgments of God are about to fall upon the earth. And we should m most earnestly present before the people the warning of the Lord that the, word, that the Lord has commissioned to give us. For then sh sh there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Men's hearts failing them for fear and looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Amen. So how, we're almost, we're wrapping up right now. How is this supposed to be accomplished? No more slides, I ran out of time. <laughs> but how is this supposed to be accomplished? How is receiving Christ's righteousness to be instructed by the teacher of righteousness, to receive the latter rain, the loud cry of the third angel's message, to give that message, how is that supposed to happen? There's a lot of answers, but... Amen. Amen. Self-idolatry, which lies at the foundation of all sin, must be crucified. It's not an option. Anyhow, that's the thoughts. Say it again. Oh, that's right. I like what you said there. Empty all of our self of self. Let this mind be in you, which also was in where? Christ Jesus. So the only way to actually keep these commandments in mind and to appropriate Christ's righteousness is to have, is to empty ourself of all this stuff and let Christ come in. We can't make him come in. We can let him come in. We can yield to him coming in. John 15, 7. Abide in him and he will abide in you. Amen. Daily. Amen. 15, 7. 15, John 15, 7. That's right. There needs to be a, a daily abiding with Christ. I also have another verse. Um, this is from David, Psalm 16, 8. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Amen. 
Are you ready to receive the latter rain? Are you ready to receive the message of God's righteousness? Because that's what it is, the teacher of righteousness. Are you ready to receive the teacher of righteousness? Whose righteousness again? Christ. But it comes from, it's God's righteousness. So according to whose idea is this righteousness? Is it according to my idea of how I see it? My interpretation of the Ten Commandments? God's interpretation, God's mind. That's why we have to let this mind be in us, the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. Because he knows, because he, him and his Father are one, he knows what will fulfill the law. He knows how to be obedient to the commandments. And the carnal mind is enmity with God. It doesn't say the carnal mind is at enmity with God. Some of the newer translations say is at enmity with God, but no. It says the carnal mind is enmity with God. That means you're against, you're contrary to, to God in your nature, your mind is. So that's why we need to have the mind of Christ in us, because it's his idea of righteousness that we need, not our own. And this is to be given according from righteousness according to righteousness, as it is given. We are to receive it according to God's idea of righteousness, not our own. God has already made us all, everyone here, everyone in the world actually, he's made us white raiment. Remember we were looking at it in Revelation 3, the white raiment, that we'd not be naked? He's made us all the white raiment, and it's free. But do you want it? Or do you want to have to work for something and then get paid death for it? Because the wages of sin is death, right? So if you get a wage, that means you what? You work for something, right? So you're working out to try to be righteous by yourself. You're working out all this stuff. And you're going to receive death. But you can receive the free gift of God. <laughs> the free gift. Do you guys want that free gift? I do too. If we have a choice about it, which we do, and if it's any work at all, it would be to do every word of God, which Jesus said three times when he was tempted. Amen. Live by every word of God and ask for help <laughs> when we're doing it. No, I agree. Um, we'll end it right there. I don't want to cut too much into Sister Monica's time, but let's have a prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this Sabbath day. Thank you for these messages that were given over 130 years ago, that they are making a comeback, and people are starting to understand, and I'm thankful that you are helping me to understand these things personally. Lord, we want to be participants. We want... <laughs> we want to see the king coming in his glory and meet him in peace and we know the only way that we can do this is through you nothing of ourselves but through you we thank you Lord for your love and as the sun is setting the westering sun is setting now on this earth's history we ask that every sin every wrong word in action that you would forgive us from all our iniquities, transgressions, and sins, all of our unrighteousness, Father. Please, right now, I ask that you would forgive everyone here of the sins that we have committed, Lord, and that from this point forward, that we would walk to you in righteousness, according to righteousness, and not that of our own, but of yours. Thank you, Father, for your love. In Jesus' name, amen.